Good day and welcome to today's Prep Tech Talk, NAPSIG Foundation, Delivering Solutions Today, Innovating for Tomorrow. My name is Charlotte Abel on behalf of the team here at NAPSIG Foundation. Thank you for joining us today. Next slide. As we begin, we have a handful of logistical items to run through with you. So due to the size of the attendance, all participants are muted for the duration of the session. Uh, we encourage you to use the Q&A functionality that you see at the bottom of your Zoom window to ask any questions. And um, we will address those Q&As throughout the duration of the webinar. And next, um, a copy of the slides, any relevant links, and a recording of this webinar will be posted to the NAPSIG Foundation website next week. So if you registered for today's session, you'll be emailed that uh, information once it's available to be notified that it's ready and ready for access. So we want today's session to be dynamic and engaging. So to help foster your engagement, um, you will be presented with questions throughout today's webinar that you can answer through a tool called Mentimeter. So you will be presented a code at relevant points through which to engage in the polls. Um, that code remains the same for all questions. And you can proceed uh, to a new question without voting if you would like to do that. And we thank you in advance for your engagement. Uh, we appreciate your input. Uh, here is our agenda for the next hour. So uh, we will start with an introduction that outlines who we are here at NAPSIG, what we do and how we do it. Uh, we'll highlight activities and resources for you, including guidelines and standards, uh, exercises and simulations, education and training, and technical assistance. And lastly, we'll wrap up with a few reminders and calls to action. So any, during any side conversations at any events that I attend on behalf of NAPSIG, a common question that comes up is about who our team is and the people who drive all the projects and efforts that they're seeing. So we wanted to share with you today uh, the people who, who make up NAPSIG. So the faces and names that you're seeing on screen are our full-time staff here at NAPSIG, uh, each lending uh, unique skills and perspectives that help advance our mission uh, through collaboration with all of you. Um, so you'll be hearing from many of us today, including from our directors, Terry Martin and Kevin Kay, and from Jared Doka, program manager here, and from Adam Fackler, a GIS technician, uh, but first, I am going to hand things over to Peter O'Rourke, our executive director, who can share a quick overview of NAPSIG. So over to you, Peter. Thanks, Charlotte. Um, I think I have to update that picture. It's about 50 years ago. Um, but thanks, everyone, for joining. Um, and I'm really excited that uh, the team thought to put together this, uh, what we did in 2021 and what, what the next year is going to look like. Um, and just scrolling through the participant list, it's just great to see so many names from so many people who, when we talk about all these things that we've done, you, you've really been a part of those things. Um, you've helped us either spur those ideas or you've um, contributed to making them successful. You've given us critique. Um, you just are the heart and soul of NAPSIG Foundation. And just, you know, a big thank you from everyone for all the work that you guys do. Um, to help us be helpful to the broader community. Um, but jumping to what I'm actually supposed to talk about now, uh, NAPSIG Foundation, as I think most of you know, we're a 501c3, which means we're not really um, a um, member organization. We're a nonprofit that's established as an organization that is controlled and governed by a board of directors. Um, and our board of directors is comprised of mostly active duty or recently retired public safety officials. So they give us the direction of what we're supposed to do, how we're supposed to think, how we're supposed to serve the broader public safety community. But we, we like to think of you all um, as our members, even though technically we don't charge you membership dues and we don't give official memberships because of our tax status, um, we have over 20,000 public safety officials, agencies, GIS staff, um, broad swath of the country that really comprises our membership. Um, it's mostly in the US, but we actually span multiple countries around the globe. So it's really an international organization, even though we always um, and primarily focus on the US. Um, it's certainly something that we're proud of that we have a, a reach all across the world. And, and what we do as a 501c3 and, and as, as an organization is really focus on training and tools and best practices. 
Um, and most important is we don't charge for those. Um, none of the trainings we do, none of the tools we do, none of the best practices we do have a cost to it. Um, that's primarily because we don't wanna charge people who respond to events a penny for anything. Um, the benefit we also see is a lot of private sector folks can make use of the tools and the directions and the best practices that we put together so that they can better serve, you know, in a for-profit sense, um, the public safety community as well. So we find that to be a, a good business model, um, hard for us sometimes to uh, grow because it, it limits our ability to generate revenue, but we're really proud of the fact that we don't charge anything to, to you all. And the last thing in this slide we'll just show you is these are the organizations that help create NAPSIG Foundation. Um, they're all pr primarily public safety organization. Esri is the one that's obviously not, but Esri was really fundamental in helping to create us. But really, we are created by and for public safety um, officials. Um, so we can hop to the next slide. One of the things we're really excited about this year is we, we spent time as a staff in September um, at uh, Tommy Hicks Farm in Virginia, um, a wonderful setting. We're all thinking of just relocating into Tommy's house in Virginia and working on the farm and doing GIS. But um, we spent time in that, that staff retreat really thinking about who are we as an organization. And so we, we came up with a revamp mission statement. We ran it through our board of directors. And what we um, came up with is essentially these three areas for our mission. Um, I'm not going to read through these, um, you can read them, but just give you a couple of highlights. Um, the first one is the most important word for me here is with. Um, we don't and should not come up with solutions or tools or capabilities or anything that doesn't serve an express need that has been articulated to us by the public safety community. So if we're doing things that aren't actually solving your problems that are real problems and they're real solutions to your problems and you're helping us do that, we're missing the mark. So please always keep an eye out for that, help make sure that we're on the mark with that. Um, and help make sure that you're also contributing ideas, gaps, problems, resources, things that we can do to make you better. Um, so that with is the most important word for me in that second one. I'm sorry, the first one. The, the second where we foster adoption, really all of that is is NAPSIC Foundation is here to be a tool for you. Um, we wanna be a tool to help you whether you're, you don't even know how to spell GIS or you're probably the best GIS are out there. We wanna be a tool to help you and we can help you along your GI geospatial journey. Um, and that is a daily operations perspective as well as big disasters. Um, and so really think of us as that tool to help you no matter where you are in your geospatial journey. And then finally, the last one where we bridge gaps, really think about it this way. For, for us as an organization, GIS is glue. Um, it's a glue where we all creates a team where we all can actually um, operate in a single platform, whether you're um, a fire department in a small rural area, your fire department in New York, you're um, a police agency, you're a sheriff, you're an emergency manager, public safety, public health official, wherever you are, GIS is the glue that brings us all together. And that glue, that single platform is how we serve our community and make our community safer. Um, so that's really the, the message we wanted to convey with this new mission statement. Um, we look forward to hearing from you about that mission statement or the things that you think you strongly agree with, things you don't think are clear. Um, reach out to me anytime. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this mission. But for us, it's getting back to our roots and really focusing on how we, we um, help foster and grow the geospatial community. Uh, next slide. Great. Um, and again, I think a lot of you have seen this slide, so I'm not going to go through it in too much detail. But really, at the end of the day, um, this is the, 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 the pyramid for how we operate as an organization. Um, and I'll just highlight in this that everything we do, everything that makes us as an organization successful and hopefully you as practitioners successful, um, is guided and directed by your needs. What you tell us is a problem you want us to help solve. Tell us you have a solution that can help solve other people's problems. Um, everything we do, we're trying to um, focus the uh, making us better to be, make your jobs better. Um, and so all of that is encompassed in this how we do what we do slide. 
So whether that's guidelines or simulations and exercises or training or actually hands, you know, get your hands dirty tech assistance, those are the things that we try to do as an organization. And we, we need your help to continue to do that well. So again, part of this is I'll tell you what we've done. The other part of it is please help us continue to help you. Um, and I'm always available. Please never feel that you can't reach out to me directly. Um, everyone else on the team is available, but please always know that you can contact me directly for anything. With that, I thank you for joining. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Kevin Kay. Great. Uh, thanks, Peter. And hey, everyone, this is Kevin Kay. Uh, really excited and honored to share some of the work the team has done this past year. Uh, as we talk about our mission statement and how we carry it out, national guidelines and standards is really where we start. It's that foundation. Uh, we define and promulgate the consistent use of best practices, and we do this through the development of national guidelines and standards. Again, as Peter mentioned, this is driven by the community, uh, so I'm really excited that I get to talk about a few of them today. Next slide. So the first one we're going to talk about today is the best practices to indoor mapping, tracking, and navigation. And I saw some of the participants in the webinar. I know a lot of you are familiar with this or have contributed to it. So if you are one of those people, really appreciate that and pat yourself on the back this year. So we partnered with the Public Safety Communications Research Division out of the National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST as most folks know them, to really look at the information access or I-axis. What the I-axis is, it's really all the information that responders may have access to, especially indoors. So think biometric devices, dynamic routing, tracking of personnel and buildings within some meter accuracy, or even utilizing augmented and virtual reality technology. So we released the guide in February of this year in coordination with the location-based services first responder working group. So again, hitting on the topic of the community. This is a group of subject matter experts from law, fire, EMS, academia, the private sector, and the vendor community. It's really meant to look at the adoption of technologies today and set the roadmap for agencies to implement or improve the program in the future. More importantly, it is discipline, platform, device, and vendor agnostic. This was really a big concern for the location-based services working group as they looked across the IX's technology ecosystem. And finally, there's an iAccess community hub with pre-planning sandboxes, materials from the location-based services meetings, presentations, and other resources. In a sense, we are just trying to make sure that the best practices guide meets the needs of the community to accelerate the adoption of indoor mapping technology. So what's next for the iAccess project? Well, technology doesn't just wait around and it's changed since we first did the first version. We've included some substantial changes in version two to reflect this. The user interface and user experience piece continues to be a challenge when designing and adopting these technologies. And we've attempted to address that in version two. We also wanted to create a supplemental section focused on high level information in the form of infographics. You can see a few examples here. In total, we have 10 graphics. They cover everything from putting together a team to conducting a systems and software audit all the way to picking a project management approach to implement emerging LBS technology. Really, we want these infographics to be a quick view of what you might need to do to implement a best practices uh, guide or program at your organization. Uh, and this will be a supplemental piece to the overall guide that you can use as a standalone document. So next slide. Thanks. So that's all pretty cool stuff. Um, but we are many years out from widespread adoption. We're probably looking five, 10 years out there. Uh, what we want to know right now is if you have the ability to track some personnel indoors, as well as if your organization is exploring augmented or virtual reality technology for operational use. So go ahead and use that Menti QR code when you have time. And Bree just put the link in the chat as well. And as you have time to fill that up, that'd be much appreciated so we could see where you as kind of our community are at with this technology. Next slide. So whereas the iAccess project is looking five to 10 years out in terms of technology, our geospatial game plans allow organizations to utilize available data sets and workflows today. As part of our project with the Department of Homeland Security Science and Technology Directorate, 
we are identifying best practices and guidelines for technology to help prepare for and respond to flooding across the country. Through partnerships with our pilot projects in South Carolina and Colorado, and I see some of you on the call, we have created geospatial game plans. These are hazard specific templates to help organizations prepare geospatially. So you can see our wildfire geospatial game plan down there in the corner. It will walk you through the geospatial resources needed for all phases from the wildland fire potential outlook to fire weather warnings, current wildfires, and finally to imagery showing what the impacts are. This is a step in the overall geospatial game plan process. That also includes assembling your team, identifying core information needs, and then putting your processes and procedures into a usable format. We have addressed the hazards you see on the screen, but the template is also available for you to tailor the geospatial game plan to your organization. Next slide. Uh, next up for this project is the development of the next version of the National Flood Preparedness Guideline and the Flood Hub. So you can see in the top right, the first version of the National Flood Preparedness Guideline was released in 2017. And that was really a result of workshops in Iowa, Texas, and Louisiana, and their unique concerns with flooding. Again, being driven by the community is what these documents, standards, and guidelines are all about. The current working group is working on the next version, and it still consists of local, state, federal, academic, private sector experts. And they're really looking at the differences in technology and processes since 2017. The guide really focuses on five key areas. Uh, you can see them listed here. For alert and warning, we're looking at items such as utilizing geofences, identifying appropriate language, and designing public maps to convey the appropriate information. On resource management, we're trying to utilize resource management tools to ensure that we could appropriately address flood impacts and move resources where they need to go. For flood modeling, we're providing a snapshot of available flood models and when to use each one. Data management is becoming very difficult with the breadth of data available. So this really talks about how you manage the different data sources, whether it be authoritative or crowdsourced. And finally, data visualization how we create something actionable out of the data to be consumed by multiple stakeholders. The other piece here is the Flood Hub. The Flood Hub is in development and includes all the prototypes and resources generated out of this project. You'll see items such as fire mappers and photo mappers. Those are volunteer led initiatives, sandboxes that Jared will speak to later, and core information needs data sets are all included in one location. Next slide. So we could spend the entire day talking about just, but a big question on our mind is whether your organization utilizes flood modeling products for preparedness and response. Some examples might be HAZIS or the National Weather Model or the US Corp Engineer Water Management System. There's a lot out there and we're just really interested to see what you're currently using. Again, you could use the same Menti link to answer all these questions. Next slide. So shifting gears really from tactical to more technical solutions, uh, we're really excited about version three of the information sharing standards you see here. So these guides are really meant to provide the requisite knowledge to aid in the acquisition and selection of incident management technologies and to ensure that information sharing requirements and standards are included in the development and implementation process. This is definitely more technical compared to some of the other resources we've covered today. This time, we decided to break it into two separate guides, the job aid for incident management technology and the technical guide for incident management technology. The job aid is a higher level document and provides recommended standards, most of them out of the Organization for the Advancement of Structured Information Standards, or OASIS, a use case scenario, implementation processes, and standards workflows for situational awareness and resource management. This guide was also turned into an interactive story map to allow you to progress through it at your own speed. The technical guide digs a bit deeper into specific workflows, such as FME, MQTT, and HTTP, among other acronyms that we all probably know at this point, and provides examples of how they address situational awareness and resource management needs. Next slide. All of these standards ultimately impact how we share resource management and mutual aid information. 
So the National Capability Review is the final guideline that includes all of the activities in the mutual aid technology space since 2019. This includes the National Resource Management Summit and the National Mutual Aid Technology Exercise, which Charlotte will speak to later. The National Resource Management Summit was an opportunity to address business and policy rules for viewing and sharing of resource information, optimizing resource inventorying and personnel qualification workflows, integrating these with credentialing workflows, and finally looking at data analytics and visualization. The National Capability Review truly is a roadmap on where resource management and crisis management and finally mutual aid systems are going. Next slide. Now I'll hand it over to Charlotte to continue on. Thank you, Kevin. So we understand that any guidelines or standards uh, need to be entered into an environment in which we understand and getting an understanding of, of the climate and where things stand is a very helpful step in developing any type of guidance. So uh, last year and part of this year, we here at NAPSIG conducted a study called the Resource Management Maturity Study. So the purpose of this study was to form a baseline understanding of the extent of the implementation of resource typing, inventorying, and qualifications management across the nation at all levels. So at local, county, state, tribal, territorial, and even federal levels. So as part of this study, we uh, explored four key questions. So the first is, what is the status in implementing the resource management principles and concepts that we find in the National Incident Management System, better known as NIMS, that was originally set forth in 2004? And that document guides all levels of government, NGO, and the private sector to work together to prevent, protect against, mitigate, respond to, and recover from incidents. So what is our progress in implementing that? Uh, what is our status in implementing the National Qualification System, or NQS, that was released in 2017? So that supplements NIMS by establishing guidance and tools to assist stakeholders in developing processes for qualifying, certifying, and credentialing deployable emergency personnel. Uh, what challenges do we experience in implementing NIMS and NQS? And then additionally, what technology tools are we using today to support implementation and also what capabilities are needed to advance our resource management principles? So all of these questions were explored in this study. Next slide. We had released a preliminary report last year, but the final report was released in October of this year and is available on the NAPSIG website, or you can even Google NAPSIG Resource Management Maturity Study and you'll find it. Uh, findings from this study um, are intended to help uh, foster or be used to inform resource management and mutual aid efforts. So with that, I am going to hand things over to Terry to discuss some other guidance that's available. Awesome. Thank you, Charlotte. Um, I'm excited to see so many familiar names and new folks joining us today. Um, so I first wanted to share an effort that began in 2020. So we partnered with URISA's Community Resilience uh, Committee to conduct a study on available risk, vulnerability, and resilience indices. At that time, it seemed that we were continually encountering new indices available for these measures, and it wasn't immediately clear which was the most appropriate to use in different use cases. So through a DHS s and funded program, we were able to form a focus group of emergency management professionals, academics, geospatial technologists, and spatial scientists to try to sort through it all. So through our collaboration, we conducted extensive research and lit review to catalog what indices we could identify. The focus group determined uh, the criteria for which ones we would investigate further, and then we leveraged the membership's broad representation to gain insight into what information we needed to glean from each index and that the end user would need to make an informed decision. And then we needed to come up with a way to display this information in an easy to use format. So the goal that was outlined by the group was to assist the emergency management and public safety community in quickly understanding which indices are available, the data methodologies behind them, and then their relevance for use in preparedness and response. This is important because each of these indices and indicators provide valuable insights into our communities. None are necessarily better than the other. We simply recognize that it can take time and effort to thoroughly understand the methodologies used in their development and assess what each are actually communicating. 
So shown here is a screenshot of the guidance and the five indices that we ultimately included. The criteria was that it needed to be publicly available, so without cost, national in coverage. For example, there are some indices that are developed for a very specific region, and they could not be hazard specific, so couldn't focus on just wildfires or flood risk. So since the release of the guidance, it has served as a basis for a URSA certified workshop and led to NAPSIG's development of a FEMA higher education module on community risk, vulnerability, and resilience. So if we go to the next slide, so today there are even more indices available, and we hope to get support for an update to the guidance, which includes other relevant data sets that either meet our current criteria or expand the scope. For example, there could be a solid case for cataloging and sharing methodologies for regional indices. On your screen is a QR code and a link to the guidance and location for you to contribute. So this is always open. So as you encounter one in the future, you can certainly come back and add it. We would love for you to share that with us as well as how you are using indices in your organizations. So next, I'd like to switch gears and go to the next slide, perfect. Um, and share some updates on Symbology. So Symbology may be one of the efforts we are most known for. It certainly is one of the longest running initiatives. To date, we have added 13 categories of symbols that include almost 1,200 symbols in total. About 180 of those directly supported the Homeland Infrastructure Foundational Level data or high field. Our most recent additions to our symbology were the creation of the new icons for FEMA's community lifelines and subcomponents, new alert symbols to support FEMA's individual and community preparedness division, and we updated some of our search and rescue symbology to align with FEMA's damage categories. So if we go to the next slide. Additionally, um, for those of you who use our symbology, you may be happy to hear that we've started providing ArcGIS Pro styles. While ArcMap styles could be imported, the quality could sometimes be impacted. So as they are completed, we're posting them in an AGL group for everyone to access. During this process, we're also creating high quality true SVGs. Those are not published to our tool yet, but we can package those up and show them upon request. And finally, this past year, we entered into a Cooperative Research and Development Agreement, or CRADA, with DHS. The agency has leveraged NAPSIG symbology for their augmented reality sand table. Through the CRADA, we're working to provide the tool they developed to the community as part of our next iteration of the Symbol Library tool, which should be available mid-2022. So we're always interested in how our resources are getting used by the community. Most of the time, we just stumble upon your great work that leverages the standard instant symbols. Um, but we would love to hear if you're using them, if there are gaps that you think we should prioritize in the future, we'd love to get that feedback. So with that, I will hand it back over to Charlotte, who is going to get us started on our next section on exercises and simulation. Over to you. Thanks so much, Terry. So part of our work here at NAPSIG includes facilitating and participating in exercises and simulations across the nation. So through this work, we're able to further foster the adoption and integration of those tools, information, and best practices that we talked about in our mission, as well as document challenges and validate plans and processes. So next, uh, we're going to cover one such exercise, which is the Biennial National Mutual Aid Technology Exercise, better known as Inmate. So uh, this exercise series builds from past efforts to advance technology and interoperability among mutual aid and incident management systems. So on the left-hand side of the screen, you see uh, this year's goal. So this year's exercise just wrapped up last week with a hot wash in Washington, DC with over 40 stakeholders in person and online. And the goal that we were working toward is uh, to demonstrate an exercise policy and technology interoperability among resource and incident management systems in two ways. So one was through the seamless exchange of priority information. So player organizations interacted with um, uh, an application programming interface that connected with uh, preparedness data to see how they could utilize that data and uh, visualize it in maps and dashboards and those sorts of things. And then also the application of this technology in organizational structures. So we recognize that technology has to follow the people and processes that are in place within organizations. And if it doesn't, the technology is going to fall down. So exploring what the needs are within the community to help drive technology development. So the event brought together six player organizations of various types across the nation, as well as multiple government agencies at the federal level. 
Um, if you can go to the next slide. So we're currently working to draft the after action report from this year's inmate. Uh, it's slated to be published next month. So keep an eye out for it on our website and in our social media posts. Um, I look forward to, to seeing that finalized and out, uh, out in, in the wild for the public to see. Um, and before I hand things over to Jared to discuss additional exercises from this year, uh, I'd love to get your insights and have you participate in this next Mentimeter poll. So our question is of what do you think is the biggest challenge to system interoperability within public safety? So we've captured a few options of technology capabilities. Is it policies and doctrine? Uh, just an awareness of needs that those aren't uh, um, readily understood, so they're not being addressed? Or is it a unified path forward and accompanying guidance that can help pave the way uh, for where we need to go to have interoperability? So those were some of the types of issues that we explore through Inmate. Um, this year's built on the last two from 2017 and 2019. Uh, we have more information about that on our website, and that, that link will be included with the materials when we get them posted on the website next week from today's webinar. So with that, uh, I will hand things over to Jared. Thanks. Thanks, Charlotte. Um, so another uh, larger exercise that we helped with this year was the uh, a nationwide tabletop exercise with FEMA and state urban search and rescue teams. Uh, this was an asynchronous exercise where we um, basically uh, ran an exercise over uh, almost two month time period where we allowed teams to uh, take the technology that we had developed and deployed into the FEMA ArcGIS Online organization and uh, use it for their own mini training exercises across the country, but it all fed into the to one common operating platform. And what this did, it helped uh, demonstrate the technical ability um, teams were able to um, go through the wide area search process. So um, actually plan out an area and then uh, deploy teams into that area and do data collection as they would on a, a wide area search uh, for a hurricane. And then it also allowed them to collect pre-incident planning data. So uh, we tasked teams with uh, collecting points such as uh, helicopter landing zones or casualty collection points, uh, data that could be uh, collected and, and basically kept for a real world incident that would happen within their jurisdiction. And throughout the uh, almost two months, we had this open. We had teams from across the country uh, participate, and then we all came together uh, for an AAR to debrief. And really, it was, it was a great uh, exercise in um, deploying the tools and got people ready for uh, real world events. And we actually uh, deployed the same tools uh, not long after we closed the exercise at the Surfside Building Collapse. And then again, a uh, month or so later at Hurricane Ida. And during Hurricane Ida, uh, we were able to bring 33 uh, separate uh, federal, state, and local search and rescue teams all together under one platform uh, to do uh, data collection. So this large scale exercise really did help prepare us uh, for this year's. Um, uh, real world events. Shifting gears a little bit, I uh, want to talk a little bit about education and training. So as opposed to those large scale exercises, it's it's the day-to-day -day, um, training and and education that, that we also uh, want to promote here at NAPSIG. And a couple examples. Uh, the first one, talk about our urban search and rescue sandbox again. Uh, so this is a comprehensive training environment where we have uh, multiple mobile applications and web applications all built into uh, one system. And this is a, an exact copy of the operational tools being used uh, by FEMA and other state teams uh, throughout the country. And um, this is open. We, we specifically created it so that you don't need a login to use it. So if you are testing the waters and you want to just see what this is about, you're able to get in and drop some points um, and see, see how it works. Uh, as you uh, progress your skills. Uh, you can set it up for small team trainings um, and then also uh, larger larger trainings. And throughout the year, we've supported almost 40 separate uh, training events, not counting the day-to-day -day, uh, systems checks and, and trainings that, that people do. And 
as I said, we, we created this system as a, it's part of the National Search and Rescue Geospatial Coordination Group, where we have everybody feeding data into the same system. Uh, but we do realize that some smaller localities uh, may want to deploy these tools for their, their own use and, and tweak them. And so we created uh, what we called Wide Area Search Solution, and it's a, a basic solution that you can deploy through ArcGIS uh, Hub, and uh, it will it's, it's similar to uh, the Esri solutions. It'll create all the apps, the web apps um, for you. And we have documentation on how to set that up. So that is available if that's something you would like to uh, test out. Another sandbox we have set up for day-to-day uh, -day training is the shelter sandbox. This came about through our work with the uh, Colorado uh, North Central All Hazards region. And we work, while working with them, uh, we developed a, a way to open and close shelters and manage shelters at a regional level. And again, this is a, a copy of the operational tools being used uh, by that region. And this is available, again, for you to go in um, and play around with and, and practice um, doing opening and closing shelters. And it's also integrated with the public information tool. So uh, on one side, you have, if you log in, you can uh, create shelters, and then on a public side, they would be able to see the shelters that were open and closed. And again, we have developed a uh, shelter management deployment kit. Uh, this one isn't quite as uh, easy to deploy. There's a few more manual steps, but we have them documented on our hub site, which we will uh, send a link out to after this. And it utilizes some of our standard symbology that uh, Terry talked about earlier. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to uh, Terry to talk about uh, tech assistance. Awesome. Thank you, Jared. So as Jared just spoke to, and as Peter mentioned in his welcome, we provide technical support both during blue skies and gray skies. Uh, gray skies. So today we just have uh, a little bit of time to mention some uh, recent examples. So if we go to our first slide in this section, thank you. Um, so the first one we wanted to highlight was really one of our favorite collaborations and ensure that the community was aware of the resources that have come out of this partnership. These are all joint efforts between NAPSIG, URIS's GIS Core, and CEDAR Digital Core. So the photo mappers effort is actually in its fifth year and brings together GIS Core volunteers from across the country to scour social media and news outlets for photos showing on the ground conditions during an incident. To date, they have geolocated about 8,000 photos from disasters, and these are all made publicly available as feature services. Um, what's so impressive is that this is often one of the first data sets available providing situational awareness for an incident. So next, uh, Fire Mappers was born from the wildfire initial attack web map application developed by our close colleague, Paul Doherty, formerly with NAPSIG. So his intent and the objective of the application is to map early reports of wildfires in the wildland urban interface, compile disparate sources of fire information onto a single map, and to point members of the public to the authoritative source of fire and evacuation information for each incident. It is almost hard to compute, but the application has received over 16 million views, uh, which is a testament, one, to Paul's early understanding that this was indeed a gap and to the volunteers, I see some of you uh, on today, like Keith Johnson, who's a superstar, uh, for all the work that they've done um, putting this together. Next, um, the Fire Mappers effort has actually led to this next one, the Crisis Communication Catalog. As volunteers map new fires, they search for authoritative websites to add actionable information on evacuations and sheltering. And this takes time. And we thought, what if we already had this information in a data layer that new fire points could just ingest? As you can imagine, it's a big job to try and gather all of this information for the entire country. And this is actually where we can really use your help. So we'll share a link um, with the hope that you will help us turn this map green by completing your community if it's not already done. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Adam to share another resource. Over to you, Adam. Thanks, Terry. So a new initiative that's uh, being launched by NAPSIG is our GitHub repository. Uh, this repository is designed to be a place that we uh, store our template versions of various scripts and uh, other codes that we create here at NAPSIG uh, to be used by our partners and those in the public safety sector. Um, this kind of started out as 
uh, under our S and T project, um, and as we would get uh, get questions about our scripts or ask to share them, uh, we decided to put them in a GitHub repository, and we decided, well, why stop at just our S and T projects? So we've expanded it beyond just uh, those scripts that we developed for USAR um, and our uh, our S and T project. So this is open and free to the public. And you can go there right now and download every script on there. Um, and every script includes instructions on how it can be actually implemented into your own environment. And it's all built right into the script uh, using either headers, uh, if it's a uh, uh, Jupyter notebook, or comments if it's uh, uh, an Arcade or Python script. So right now, there's 10 different uh, Jupyter Notebook and Arcade scripts right now in the, in the uh, repository. These include scripts to archive data, uh, automatically check web map status, um, and various Arcade scripts, such as those unique pop-ups that are uh, within Fire Mappers and Crisis Communication Catalog, and just several other uh, fairly uh, common Arcade scripts that are used across various different projects. Um, updates will be com coming as needed and will include any bug fixes or just overall enhancements to the tutorials or to the code itself. Um, and we'll be adding a new code as that becomes available. And uh, a link, I, I believe was provided in the chat and will also be sent out uh, with this PowerPoint, but it's pretty easy to find github.com slash knapsig slash public code. Uh, next slide, please. So if you're interested in a, a brown bag session on um, how to use this repository, uh, you can respond to the Mentimeter that's here on the screen. After this presentation, we'll reach out to all of you and uh, schedule a session to do that. Uh, this uh, brown bag will include how to actually use GitHub um, in, our, uh, in this manner, um, how to pull the scripts from GitHub into your own um, into your own organization, to your environment, and as well as how to contact us about any bugs you might find or just suggested uh, enhancements or scripts that we should include in our repository. So with that, I'm turning it back over to Terry. Thank you, Adam. So the next thing I want to talk about, you all may be familiar with um, the Pandemic Task Force, which was formed in May of 2020 with the goal to increase pandemic preparedness and unity of effort by enabling effective information sharing and use of location-enabled technology for informing critical decision-making. So our founding organizations included NAPSIG, URISA, and NISJIC. However, the task force has expanded to add IEM, AASHTO, and NATO. In the winter of 2020, the task force released version one of the COVID-19 technology and GIS after action report and improvement plan, and has coordinated with federal interagencies after action teams on integration of findings. So the next steps, which are shown here, is for the task force to develop and promote the use of a standardized national playbook for integrating technology in GIS and pandemic response and recovery. So we encourage you to keep an eye out for future updates and opportunities to contribute to that effort. Uh, next slide. So before we close out, we at NAPSIG wanted to give a special shout out uh, to these individuals and all of the volunteers without which photo mappers and fire mappers to just name the activities that support NAPSIG would just not be possible. And I've added some stars to say a special thank you to German Whitley uh, German has been the lead on disaster projects for GIS Corps over these past five years. And as some on her team have called her the rock that kept the team on track. There are a lot of moving parts to managing the team, volunteers, developing and putting on training, not to mention the technical component of building and publishing data and apps. Um, I hear that she has averaged 12 missions a year and accumulated thousands of volunteer hours. So we are humbled by her dedication and extremely grateful to have had her to work with and guide these efforts from the beginning. So with that, I will hand it back over to Charlotte with the last few items. Go ahead, Jared. All right, I'm gonna jump in here. Um, so you guys have heard a lot about um, some of the activities NAPSIC's been involved in and some of the what we're looking forward to uh, in the next year. Uh, 
but as Peter said, uh, none of this can be done without you. And so really, this is, a, this is your call to action. Um, and we would like to have you um, help us as we move forward. And one thing I've been uh, working on a little bit behind the scenes and what we hope to roll out uh, later next year is what we're kind of calling the NAPSIC community and uh, really building that up and giving us a, a place where we can collaborate and work together. Uh, so using a combination of ArcGIS Hub um, and Microsoft Teams, uh, we're, we're hoping to kind of build a place that people can uh, go to and work on different projects together. Uh, so if you're interested in uh, being part of a cadre of tra trained GIS members support disaster response, or uh, if you're just interested in volunteer opportunities at NAPSIC in general, we'd love to hear from you. Also, there is potential uh, future developments in some uh, Symbology Working Group. Uh, so I believe Bree just dropped the link into the chat for this. So if you um, are interested, we would love to have you um, respond and we'll be sending out um, information after the first of the year on how you can uh, be further involved. Uh, so. Thank you for everyone for the work that you've already done and we look forward to working with you more in the future. I'm gonna hand it over to Charlotte now. Great, thanks Jared. And yeah, we'd love love to, to hear from you and get you signed up and connected uh, with, with some of these future efforts. So uh, before we wind down today's session, we wanted to provide one final reminder. Uh, some of you may have received this if you're on our mailing list about the save the date for Inspire next year. So that's the Innovation Summit for Preparedness and Resilience. Uh, 2020 had forced us into early this spring having uh, an event that was online, but we're excited to be back in person. Uh, so please mark your calendars for Inspire 2022. It's gonna be held October 25th and 26th at Oklahoma State University. Uh, we're, we're already looking forward to the sessions that we're going to be able to have. And uh, we always appreciate being able to engage with you at that event and uh, uh, just hear from you and where things are going and um, just foster better engagement. So as always, it's a no cost event for our public safety colleagues, thanks to the generosity of our sponsors. And we're so thankful for that. Uh, next slide, I think that winds us down and that's a wrap for today. So thanks again so much for joining us. Uh, we look forward to engaging with you at a future event and uh, reach out by any of these means if you need us in the meantime. So take care. Bye.